Last two weeks, we've talked about branches. And we started off with the thought of speaking of the good things that branches are created for. And we need to do that because branches were stated of by God and they serve a purpose. They serve God's purpose and we need to not lose sight of that. But I start there because we then moved into looking at the way branches worked in the scriptures and what we find is that there are times as we looked at the brass serpent that we could have something that is good but if we don't use it in the manner designed of God then it can become something less and sometimes not good. We remember what happened to the brass serpent that King Hezekiah destroyed it and that didn't mean that it had not had a significant purpose and it was referred to again in John 3.14 through 3.16. Now, that being said, I wanted to just go over a couple things from last week to lay the groundwork. Because where we're going to move into today is looking at priesthood and next Sunday as well. And with the same criterion that we looked at on branches. That is, are the priesthood functioning in the manner designed of God? And we have to always take a look at how we function, how priesthood function within the church, so that we do meet the criterion that our priesthood are functioning in the manner designed of God. Because that's the way that not only priesthood would be blessed, but the priesthood could be a blessing uh, to those of this world. If you remember, we went through some things, if you have your scriptures with you, Mosiah 11, starting with verse 97. And it came to pass the king Messiah granted unto Alma that he might establish churches through all the land of Zarahemla and gave him power to ordain priests and teachers over every church. Now, I'm suggesting here that churches are used more in what we would understand as branches. He wasn't setting up, as we talk about in our society today, he wasn't setting up churches that were different denominations because we're gonna see as we read the next few verses that that's not what is meant here. Now this was done because there were so many people that they could not all be governed by one teacher. Neither could they all hear the word of God in one assembly. Therefore, they did assemble themselves together in different bodies, being called churches. Now also, as we look at our condition now in the center place, and in the domestic field, and the international field, I will tell you, having been in many, many branches, they don't all function quite the same way. And there is uh, some benefit to that. Sometimes there is some hardship because there might be different teachings and different practices and that kind of thing. But the, one of the advantages would be that we have a diversity amongst our people. And so our worship in the Philippines is not something that you would be saying, I have no idea what they're doing here. No, you would know what they're doing, but would it be exactly what it is in Living Hope? No. And then there's also the other uh, branches around that would have the same thing. And so let's go on with the scripture. Every church having priests and teachers and every priest preaching the word according as it was delivered him by the mouth of Alma. Now Alma, what we're seeing here, has, uh, and he's a high priest, has some functioning here, similar at least, although not identified as such, the first presidency. 
because the First Presidency would have some responsibility in terms of being interpreters of the law. And so they were preaching the word according as it was delivered to them by the mouth of Alma. And thus, notwithstanding there being many churches, they were all one church, yea, even the church of God. For there was nothing preached in all the churches except it were repentance and faith in God. And now there were seven churches in the land of Zarahemla. So we get a little view of how the church functioned in the Book of Mormon. And what we see that although they were seven churches around Zarahemla, is that they weren't seven different churches. They were churches that worshiped the Lord. They were churches that recognized the commonality that they had. And so I think we can say by the scripture we just looked at that there was a unity there. And really that is something we seek to ever achieve in all ages and certainly in the age in which we're living. And we need to work towards that. And that could be held for another time, another discussion. Because then we move into another time when the Lord identifies seven churches. And this is in the book of Revelations. Now, the seven churches are all mentioned there, and I just briefly went over them at the end of the class, but I don't want to take up too much time on them. But what we see is that in each one, the Lord would identify some of their strengths. At the same time, he would identify some things that they would come up short on. Now, it's okay for us to ponder if the Lord came to Living Hope and to other branches, and in this case, of course, it's the Apostle John who's doing the writing, what would he say about our branches? Now, I'm going to guess, because we're not perfect people, that we, I'm gonna guess that we do not have perfect branches. And it's okay for us to acknowledge that and not feel that we're pointing fingers at anybody. It's uh, sometimes when I'm counseling those who want to get married and I share with them this idea that you hear about people that have the perfect marriage. Well, I wish I could say that uh, on behalf of Robin that she would make that statement However, I'm not sure how she could because two people that are not perfect forming something that is perfect doesn't stand to reason. Now, can it be greater than the sum of its parts? Synergy is what that's called. Yes. Can there be moments where you achieve some perfection within the marriage? Yes. But it's okay to acknowledge that we don't always get it right. If I am a sinner and I proclaim to you that I am a sinner, then how is a sinner going to be part of a perfect marriage? It's only through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ that those times can be even touched. So I say that because when it goes down through these seven churches, we can look at them and we could say, oh, yeah, that's the other guy. You know, I, I know why Branch X is not having the spirit in fulfillment because look at how their priesthood operate or look at uh, what they're teaching or look at the fact that they don't always have a regular Wednesday night prayer service or what have you. And, you know, without being critical, I'm not. I can't be critical because I'm not good enough to be critical. But you know what we're talking about? Do we have 100% at per services? 
Do we in the priesthood function 100% the way that we should? Do we speak to each other perfectly all the time? Do we speak of each other correctly as the Lord would want us to do all the time? And that's okay. I'm here at Living Hope because I have a great love for this place and this people. And we can talk about those things without having to try to say that, oh, let's not talk about that there's anything that needs to be changed because if we do that, then we're just admitting that it's uh, not what it could be. Well, it's all right to admit that things aren't what they could be. I, every day, want to work better at my marriage than I have in the past. And there are times that I take steps forward and there are times I take steps back. And there's times that the step forward and, and the two steps back are so quick that you hardly can understand that you had a step forward because it gets lost in that shuffle that you're doing. But here's what we see in these seven churches is through the apostle John, they are told some things about their spiritual condition. And we go down through there, and I'll just highlight a couple again. And Ephesus, which had some good things happening. And the Lord praised them. But he also said something that now, I, last week I referred to the cross, but now we have the emblems in front of us too. Where the Apostle John writes to them and says, Thou hast left thy first love and that's kind of a hard thing when Robin and I have had disagreement there are times that she has uh, said something to me of which she's expressing her feeling and maybe even the, her hurt or anguish and in those moments where I don't get defensive and try to um, push it off, I realize that I know I can do better. And it's okay for branches, it's okay for priesthood to come to such a point that we can do better. And so we cannot forget. In the sacrament prayer, it, we are told to remember Jesus Christ. And so to leave the first love is suggesting that somehow there are times in our lives where we don't remember the Christ. And I'm not going to go down through, again, all of them. You can read about them in the second and third chapters of Revelations, and you can go back through the class from last week on the website. But I'm going to skip down to Philadelphia. I grew up in the Philadelphia in the United States. I grew up 15 minutes from it. And I spent a lot of time in Philadelphia, worked in Philadelphia um, and did many different things. And, and uh, you know, I, I support the Kansas City sports teams, but I'm going to tell you if Kansas City's playing Philadelphia, I still root for Philadelphia. Now, if you want me to leave the class right now, I'll, I'll do that. But I will tell you, I was all in. Once Philadelphia got eliminated, I was 100% for the Chiefs and I was okay because of my great uh, affection for Andy Reid, who used to coach for the Eagles, I was okay that even the Chiefs, if they had beaten the Eagles in the Super Bowl, I would have been okay with that because he deserved it. He's a good man. Happens to be a Latter-day Saint, by the way, a Book of Mormon believer. But anyway, in this Philadelphia, I took, a, as, um, as Arthur Oakman used to say, a tempting bypass. So now I'll come to where I want to make, and I referred to this last week. This church has an open door that no man can shut. That's a powerful statement. That is a positive statement made about a church, a branch. Even in its faithfulness, Philadelphia is told that it only has a little strength. This church is given a promise in relationship to the city of God, the New Jerusalem. Now, here's some branch that's doing great things. My goodness, if uh, we could have that report on all of our branches in this day, we would, we would feel uh, very pleased that the Lord would say such thing about our branches. But even here it says, only has a little strength. 
which suggests that there's still more. And that suggests the fact that we have to continue to work to be his people. And I love doing that with you people. I love coming to prayer service and hearing the trials that people are going through. Not that I'm glad that they're going through trials, but you know what I mean. But just to be there and that they're willing to share on that. So now I want to move on from the branches to the priesthood. And I'm going to start off telling you a testimony. As you know, what I have been doing, and there's more to come, but after next Sunday, I'm not sure when that will be as far as here, because then I go in various places for a month straight. So whether that works out at some point, we'll see. But I have been doing these things because I believe the Lord has asked me to write on subjects that we would better understand the purpose of the church and then better understand how we need to function as a people. Back in the beginning of October, and I know this for a fact because it was before I went to the Philippines, I was writing a paper and I felt directed to the Lord to do so. The title of the paper was God's Blessings Through Priesthood. Now, I have a computer that I don't know why, but every once in a while you can be writing something and then all of a sudden every line of what you're writing is now highlighted in blue. Well, you know that's a danger because if you hit a certain button, it's gone. And I don't even remember what happened. I don't know whether it's just that I breathed on the keyboard or whatever, but it was gone. And I remember my reaction was my head slumped down and I, and I tried to, um, and I have limited, limited computer skills, but I tried everything that I could to recover the paper and I could not. And so, I was in somewhat despair and kind of similar, but I don't want to make this sound anywhere in the same place as Joseph Smith Jr. when he lost the 116 pages of manuscript. But I felt a great failure at that moment. So much so that I, I, I couldn't write on that subject. And I went on to other subjects and wrote them. And on the back of my mind, I thought, I need to write that. But in doing so, I wasn't sure how that was going to work because I felt directed by what I had written. And if I wrote something that I felt was inferior to what had been written, then I would know, regardless if anybody else knew, I would know that every time I read that, it was going to be the lesser of what was to be done. And so I stayed away from that subject. And then as we started going through this class, the series of lectures, I thought about this subject again. And I was thinking, well, I'm going to have to write something on the subject because there's a second part that I want to write about the priesthood, but like the, what I wrote about the branches, I want to write something very positive first and then write something that's not critical, but it would cause us to rethink how priesthood functions within the life of the church. And so... I thought I have to do the same way. I have to put out the positive first. And the positive was in that first paper. So the time was coming. I knew that last Sunday um, I had that prepared, which was the class on the church and restoration branches, which I referred to a few minutes ago. 
And then I knew that I had to write something on the priesthood. And so I debated, should I just put down a few notes? Should I try to rewrite what I was doing before, of which now it was over four months ago, and so I didn't have a good memory of that? Or was I to go to the second part first? But I thought, that's not really what I want to do, because I want, I want people to know that there is a God-given purpose for priesthood. And so when we start talking about things that could cause priesthood to not work in a way in the manner designed of God, is no, you have to lay the, the positive groundwork first, and then you come and examine. And so this week, I came back with my family from Florida, and I was contemplating up until just uh, three days ago, what should I do? Should I, should I do part two first, or should I try to do part one again? What do, what do I do? I would ponder this over and I'd put it before the Lord and I'd say, Lord, you've caused me to write these things and I don't know what to do. I'm going to put it in your hands. And I have, as you can probably sense, I have not felt 100% this week. I have a, a chest cold. Uh, I'm not sickly like I need to go lay down at this moment, but I wasn't feeling well and I would find myself tired. And so yesterday afternoon, I, I thought to myself, okay, I've got to do something for the class. I'm not going to stand in front of the class and, and just throw out something. And then somebody would be thinking, well, boy, this isn't anything like what we've talked about before. What's the matter? And so in the afternoon yesterday, I started to think about going to the library because our printer's not working, so I would go there. And I thought, boy, my time is going quickly and I'm going to have a difficulty pulling this off. And then I was feeling so drowsy from my health condition. And so I took a nap and I woke up and it was just before four o'clock. Now I can tell you the Mid-Continent Library closes at six. And I got up and I thought to myself, I, I, that I'm, there's no way. I, I'm going to have to just go and I will put down a few scriptures and we'll have discussion that way and go from there. I resolved to myself that this, there's no way this would happen, that it could be done. And so I'm driving over there and I'm thinking, why am I even driving over here? I could write down the scriptures and we can have discussion that way. And yes, we can get by and that kind of thing. But I go and I sit down at the computer and I figure out that what I had written before that I'd lost, that that's what I needed to do. And I thought, but this isn't gonna be anything like what I'd written before in terms of its detail. And so I typed in a title and on the left side pops up recovery. And I thought, what's that? I haven't seen that, before, you know, in what I've been writing over these last several months. And so I click that on, and there comes the paper up that I'd written four months ago that I had felt was gone. I guess you can tell the paper wasn't fully written when I'd lost it, but it was in a position that I could complete it yesterday, have the copies run off and the library closed at six o'clock. I will tell you that as I was leaving, the person in the library said, it is now 5.55, the library is closing in five minutes. I went down to the Home Depot and ran off the copies. Now, why do I take some time to share that experience with you? I don't share it because it does anything for making me any better person. 
But I believe that it's been reinforced time and time again that the Lord's hand is in this work, not just these papers, but in this work. And his promises will not fail and he will provide that which we need. And so with that, we're going to go into God's blessings through priesthood. And we will, in the time that we have, uh, not be having to finish it off completely because next week will also be in regards to the priesthood, but it will be taking some different slants, but we can finish up what we're gonna be doing today. You see in this paper that I start off with a statement, the purpose of this paper is not to discuss priesthood responsibilities, but rather to focus on the intended blessing for which priesthood have been set apart. Now I say that because when we talk about priesthood, to be quite honest, I have studied priesthood and I know many of you have so much that it would be kind of, well, we've already talked about those things and, and to study what a priest does, what a 70 does, um, always valuable to refresh. And we need to restudy those scriptures all the time. But I want you to know from the beginning, that's not what we're doing here. And so if you go into second, the second paragraph, we are a blessed people. God has granted to us life and he desires to bless us abundantly in our lives. In the creation story, God revealed these words to Moses. And I, God, said unto my own only begotten, which was with me from the beginning, let us make man in our image after our likeness, and it was so. And I, God, said, let them have dominion over the fishes of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. And I, God, created man in mine own image, in the image of mine only begotten created I him, male and female created I them. And I, God, blessed them and said unto them, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it. Now, why do I start with that scripture? Well, that's a good scripture you can start anywhere because that's going back to the beginning. But as you can see, what I put in bold print was I, God, bless them that we would understand that God has created us to bless us. He didn't create us to scorn us to destroy us, but rather to bless us. And we're gonna see that as we go through more scriptures. From the beginning, God has blessed his creation of man and woman. The knowledge and testimony of God's blessings will take an eternity to share with one another. And there are numberless volumes of writings to explain and share blessings as well. For the purposes of this paper, I wish to focus specifically on the blessings of priesthood that scripture tells us God wishes to bestow on man and woman through the priesthood. I cannot adequately do justice to this subject, so I will only share a part on the blessings and the purposes of priesthood and how God has ordained the priesthood to be earthly messengers and servants. Those chosen to serve in the priesthood are to bless the people on behalf of God and Jesus Christ. One of the most significant ways to do this is through the ordinances of the church. And of course, we stand before the sacrament of the Lord's Supper. Ordinances take place in one's life at very significant times in the life of a believer. Within the restoration, there are several such ordinances. One purpose of an ordinance is to bring blessing to the participants of the ordinance. Two of those ordinances have the word blessing included in their name, baby blessing and patriarchal blessing. However, it is not difficult to see God's blessing in all of the ordinances. Baptismal blessing in water and spirit, marriage blessing, sacrament blessing, ordination blessing, etc. All of the ordinances are ministered to the people by the priesthood. 
The men of the priesthood are called to stand between heaven and earth to be messengers of God. They're called to reveal his desire to bless his creation. However, God does not limit blessings to be solely through priesthood. God has all the resources of heaven and earth at his command and all people at his command. Now, as I studied blessing, and you go back and you look at definitions and understandings, one of the writings that I came across talked about the blessing that a king would give. And if you remember, when somebody, even in this day and age, is given knighthood by the queen, and they come to present themselves before the queen, what do they do? They kneel. What are we going to do today when we come before the king? We see in this the beauty of receiving his blessing. What we know through the scriptures, our personal testimonies, and in other ways, is that God desires to bless us. We can read this clearly in the scriptures. There is no greater testimony of this by the death of Jesus Christ at the cross. Jesus died taking our sins upon himself that we might be blessed unto eternal life and be with God forever. In order to be with God and Christ, we need to respond to them in faith and in service. God has provided for blessings to be with us throughout our lives if we choose him. Opportunities to be in the company of God and heaven come to us through ordinances. As Arthur Oakman said, ordinances give us the feel of righteousness. And it's in his lectures on the endowment given in 1966, and so if you want to uh, find that, you will be able to do so. The Lord has commissioned his priesthood to bless the people. Not only do we see this in the Great Commission, but we see it in the baptismal prayer. Having been commissioned of Jesus Christ, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, amen. I baptize you. I bless you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. We partake of the sacrament this morning. We receive of his blessing as it is stated in the sacrament prayers. We can be blessed through friends, the church, and many other ways. One of the most significant ways is through priesthood. The priesthood have been called to bring blessing to the people as a servant of Jesus Christ. And so I give some scriptural support. Now, when the Lord has directed me to write in these past several months, there have been times that maybe somebody has preached a sermon or somebody has said something. And I'll think if the Lord so directs that he'll say, write on that subject. And so as I was reading in the book of Numbers back sometime in September, I came across something in Numbers chapter 6, 22 to 27. Not something that most of us would say, well, yeah, I just read that last week. I mean, there's a lot of scriptures to read. That's not any indictment on anybody here. And you can't read all the scriptures every day. So there'll be some that you haven't read in a long time. But I was reading this portion of Numbers and here's what it says. And the Lord spake unto Moses saying, speak unto Aaron and unto his sons. The Aaronic priesthood is named after Aaron. His sons would function that way. So the Lord then commanded Moses to speak unto Aaron and unto his sons, saying, On this wise you shall bless the children of Israel. Now what is it saying here in terms of their ministry? 
is the priesthood ministry is to bless the people and to be a blessing to the people. And if we're going to evaluate our ministry, we need to start there. Because blessing the people is the fact that we are involved with the people, that we have a love for the people, that we care what happens to the people, that we are willing to be diligent and serve the people. And now listen to this blessing. Here's what Aaron and his sons are told to say. Here is the blessing that a Aaronic ministry is to bring upon the people. We can talk about the duties of the Aaronic priesthood, and those are important to know. But what about the blessing? And here's what they're to say. The Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord make his face shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. And they shall put my name upon the children of Israel and I will bless them. We know also from latter day revelation that the Aaronic priesthood are to go into the homes and bless the families and its members. I could have added to this paper every priesthood office has been called to bless the people and we could go through each office and each blessing. The Melchizedek priesthood are to have the power and authority to hold the keys of all the spiritual blessings of the church. And so what we see is just as there was Moses being spoken to that tell Aaron and his sons that they are to bless the people in their Aaronic ministry is that now the Lord is going to say, and in the Melchizedek priesthood, here is what you are to do to bless the people that you are to hold the keys of all the spiritual blessings of the church, to have the privilege of receiving the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, to have the heavens open unto them, to commune with the general assembly in the church of the firstborn, and to enjoy the communion and presence of God the Father and Jesus the mediator of the new covenant. And so now we come down and we see the Aaronic priesthood purpose and blessing the, the children of Israel, the people, the Melchizedek priesthood, the spiritual blessings of the church, that we now see in our function as priesthood is it doesn't have anything to do with getting gain or status. It is to stand in the stead of Jesus Christ and to bless the people. And if we do that, we're, we're going to be faithful to our calling. And if we don't do that, then as we will see next week, we will see what happens when we use the things of God, not in the manner designed of God. And so we go down. And this is the third paragraph from the bottom. The Lord desires to bless his creation. We see this repeated throughout the scriptures. He gives the promise and blessing in Doctrine and Covenants 22, 23. There is no end to my works, neither to my words, for this is my work and my glory to bring to pass the immortality and eternal life of man. His purpose is to bless his creation. And he states it very clearly in this restored gospel scripture. The fulfilled promises of God are outcomes of his blessing. Our Father blesses us to accomplish his work and then blesses us to see that work accomplished if we are obedient to him. This becomes clear through Galatians 3.14 that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that they might receive the promise of the spirit through faith. Once again, we see the term blessing and promise tied together. The Lord has spoken through 
all ages of his plan for salvation involving the priesthood. Doctrine and Covenants 83, 3C. Therefore, in the ordinances thereof, the power of godliness is manifest. And without the ordinances thereof and the authority of the priesthood, the power of godliness is not manifest unto men in the flesh. For without this, no man can see the face of God and even the Father and live. And so we see that God ordained and created priesthood. He created for a purpose and priesthood is to be a blessing to his creation. The final paragraph on this page, the scriptures are filled with blessing. The Sermon on the Mount is filled with the phrase, blessed are they. In 1 Nephi chapter 3, 187, blessed are they who shall seek to bring forth my Zion in that day, for they shall have the gift and the power of the Holy Ghost. And if they endure unto the end, they shall be lifted up and saved in the everlasting kingdom of the Lamb. We see the scriptures are filled with blessing. He calls us, desires for us, has been willing to sacrifice his son that we might receive his blessing. So I came across the thing that talked about blessing and that there are two major themes of blessing. Now, if you add another theme, that's okay. This is not a scriptural reference, so feel free to do so. The first theme, blessing is a public declaration of a favored status with God. Not favored because you're better, I'm better, but the fact that God has chosen to bless you or me or someone else. When we receive God's favor, we receive his blessing. And we see that, that Abraham was blessed in Genesis 12, 2. Emma Smith was blessed in Doctrine and Covenants 24. Each was blessed for a divine purpose. Now, you know that is not even scratching the surface on the blessings of people mentioned in the scriptures. But how many would it take to convince us that it's a true statement? If I had a hundred blessings that are recorded in the scriptures, then I will go back this week and I will find the other 98. If I need more than that, I will find more than that. But we know that this is true. And it goes for men and for women that God desires to bless us. He de desires to bless us as a people and as a church. And so we are called to be the living church. The living sacrament not the body and the spilt blood of someone who has died and is gone, but one who came off of the cross. If you had been here at prayer service Wednesday evening, I was asked to preside, and I shared from the fourth chapter of Acts, and those who are here will know what I shared about, but I will, I will give you an understanding of what that is. We believe that the book of Luke was probably written by the disciple Luke. Luke was not of the 12, but he was certainly one who mingled with the 12 and we believe had significant time with Peter and with Paul. And Luke makes a statement in the account what it says is that the disciples were gathered with others in a prayer service. And they shared the power, and this is what Luke says, the power of the testimony of the resurrection 
of Jesus Christ. And what I posed before the prayer service on Wednesday evening is that the only way that you can speak in power about the resurrection of Jesus Christ in that service is if you knew it was true. Just like if you and I are going to speak about the power of the resurrection, only if we are convinced in our hearts is it true. And so what we see is God's blessing of his people. And then there's the second theme. The blessing endows power for prosperity and success. And I think you would know that the use of the word prosperity there is not in terms of talking about dollars and cents, but that our lives would be prosperous and our lives would be successful. Before God called Enoch's people Zion, which was in Genesis 7, 23, he says this in Genesis 7, 22, and we might, oh, we might have a tendency to start with 7, 23, but here's what led up to it. In 7, 22, and the Lord blessed the land and they were blessed upon the mountains and upon the high places and did flourish. What preceded Enoch's people being called Zion because they were one heart and one mind and dwelt in righteousness? What preceded it then was the blessing of God that was upon the land and they were blessed. For a people that desires to build Zion in this day, I don't see any other way, any alternative, any shortcut that can be had to fulfillment of his purposes than that we as a people would be endowed from on high and we would be blessed in abundance by his spirit. Brothers and sisters, this has been, in my lifetime, a remarkable experience that led to this class. Because that which was lost was found. And I could feel a bit more of when it was said of the father that the prodigal son returned. I can feel a bit more of his rejoicing of that which was lost would be found. And if in the life of the church over these last five, 10, 50 years, we have lost sight of some things, then I would pray that we would ask for those things to be restored into the life of the body, that we can fulfill his purposes for those that he has created for this day. May the Lord bless you this day. May he bless you as you partake of the sacrament. And may we continue to prepare on becoming his righteous people.